President Bola Tinubu has returned to Abuja after a one-week official visit to New Delhi in India, where he attended the G20 summit, followed by bilateral talks in the United Arab Emirates. He was received at the airport by top government officials, including the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, George Akume, Minister of the FCT, Nyeso Mwike, Minister of State for Defense, Bello Matawale, and some security chiefs. Also, First Lady Remy Tinubu has pledged to renew the lost hope of victims of violent conflict in some communities in six local government areas of Plateau State during a visit to Jos, to where she donated 500 million naira. A rice correspondent, Francis Douglas, compiled this report. First Lady Uluremi Tunubu, during this disbursement of resettlement packages of 500 displaced victims of communal clashes, is in Joss, Plato State, to comfort the victims and seek more support for them. The wife of the president says, President Bola Tinubu's administration is working to tackle insecurity across the country. She says one million naira will be disbursed to 500 selected families in the affected local governments, with 170 persons from Mangu, 100 persons from Bakin Laden, 110 persons from Riyom, 50 persons from Bokos, 20 persons from Jos South, and 50 persons from Basa local government area. The administration of President Bola Tinubu GCFR is committed to pursuing dialogue and reconciliation among Nigerians that will foster lasting peace, not only in Plateau State, but across the entire nation. The financial support of a sum of 500 million by the Naira by the Renewed Hope Initiative is a modest step towards helping these families rebuild their lives, providing them with the means to secure shelter and other essential needs. Wife of Imo State Governor and Director of the Renewed Hope Initiative, Chioma Uzodima, says the financial support of 500 million naira by the Renewed Hope Initiative is a modest step to help these families rebuild their lives, secure shelter, and other essential commodities. The Renewed Hope Initiative is an initiative driven by a collective vision of compassion, solidarity, and a commitment to improve the life to improving the lives of our fellow citizens towards a better life for the family. Plato State Governor Caleb Mofwang appreciated the kind gesture of the First Lady towards the displaced families in the state while promising the continued support of the state government to victims. It is our desire that those of you who are receiving this gift will know that you are receiving it as trustees for other members of your community. We are going to supervise the use of this money and we are going to ensure that the purpose for which Her Excellency intended it, that it is well executed. Well, President Tinubu is back, and yeah. um, First Lady, Mrs. Olu Emi Tinubu, is working. Good. So, President Tinubu is back. He's back to a lot of work and concerns. Number one concern would be the NLC. NLC is threatening another indefinite strike, saying they've not been meeting with them. So who is to oversee those conversations with the NLC as we speak today? A lot has not been done for the Nigerian workers. Who is also to oversee that conversation on the palliative that was shared as some other targets, like planting on thousands of hectares of land. These are some things President Tinubu will come back to. He'll also come back to insecurity in the country. Certain students traveling for the NYC have been kidnapped, and the kidnappers are asking for sorts of ridiculous ransoms. We should be able to nip that in the bud. He's also coming back to problems as regards our maritime sector in the country. We've had too many boats mishaps. Yes, we can talk about Libyan flood, we can talk about Moroccan earthquake, but right here on our soil, we're having too many boat mishaps and cases of insecurity here and there. So these are problems that he'll have to come back to. Welcome back, President Tinubu, but there are problems on the table you have to solve immediately. Sort out the NYC conundrum, uh, 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 the NLC conundrum once and for all, and some other problems. Good one by the wife of the president. 
uh, going out there to helping a lot of people out there in Plateau, which is good, showing the milk of human kindness. But why are we having this crisis in Plateau in the first place? Why is it that we can't solve the problem? Why have there been killings in Mangu and some Bokos and some other local government areas? Why do the people have to constantly bury their own in mass burials? Why do they have to die? Why is it that Nigeria constantly fails the people of Plateau and some other areas inundated with insecurity? Why, why, why? In as much as the 500 million naira gift is good by the First Lady, but I would rather a time that the First Lady will not have to give 500 million naira gift because people have lost their livelihood and lost their loved ones. I would rather that the state, the Nigerian state, provide security. Security of life and property is way worth more than any 5 million naira gift that will be given. It is time for the government to fix the problem. But First Lady, uh, wife of the President, Madame Olure Mitinu, thank you so much for the milk of human kindness and sending out to the people. But what we want is total cessation and end to the insecurity and the killings on the plateau and some other parts of the country. God bless Nigeria. Well, uh, the President is back. Uh, first, let's note that uh, the expected fanfare, you know, triumphal entry and all of that. Well, it didn't happen as we suspected, perhaps because it came in the evening. But in any case, it's just as well that there was no distraction uh, against, uh, you know, as, about his return. But what is important is what the presidency has tried to do. I've seen quite a number of infographics out there uh, talking about the success of his trip to New Delhi, India, on the sidelines of the uh, G20 summit, and also his stopover at the uh, UAE to meet with the president of uh, UAE and the Emir of uh, Abu Dhabi. Now, so in India, he got about 14 billion worth of uh, pledges from different investors. His trip to India also provided opportunities for Nigerian businesses, business executives to relate with their Indian counterparts. More importantly, uh, he showed up clearly very well on the world stage, engaging with many uh, world leaders, including the president of the EU Commission, for the opportunity with the president of uh, the United States, encounter with Narendra Modi, and all of that, and all of that. So, but the important thing is that at least you know, it was very good economic diplomacy trip. Then he stopped over in Dubai. The highlight of which we've been told uh, would seem to be the lifting of the uh, ban uh, on uh, Emirates and Etihad flights in and out of Nigeria, and also investment opportunities, strengthening of bilateral relations between uh, both countries. But the controversial part of it is that the Emirate News Agency as was pointed out yesterday, and as uh, the document uh, is now in circulation, did not refer to what is making Nigerians so excited, you know, that the uh, Emirates and Etihad Airlines will come back to Nigeria. So you have two countries, you know, uh, having a meeting, two different narratives, because usually each country will issue its own press statement. So many Nigerians are a bit uh, skeptical. They are saying, is it the Nigerian government trying to put a spin on it? But in any case, we'll get to know in the fullness of time what exactly was agreed upon uh, because these things cannot be uh, shrouded in uh, secrecy for a very uh, long time. So we were coming back and uh, you know the, the quiet uh, return probably is also out of the awareness that well, the uh, matter at the tribunal is uh, gone through the first stage. It will still go to the Supreme Court Maybe the celebration is postponed. And when that time comes, you can trust uh, President Tinubu's uh, supporters uh, to really uh, celebrate uh, on a grand scale. As for uh, Mrs. Oluremi Tinubu, well, she's done very well visiting Plateau State to commiserate with the people, the affected people in six local governments, just south, uh, Mangu, uh, Riyom, Bakenladi, Boko, you know, nobody should be subjected to that kind of horror, either in Plateau State or in any part of the country. Families have lost uh, their loved ones. Uh, you know, uh, uh, houses, uh, you know, people have been displaced. And the threat of this constant attack, you know, harassment of the people of uh, Plateau State and people in other parts of the country, including Southern Kaduna, 
continues. So government still has a responsibility to address this insecurity challenge. After all, the primary responsibility of the government is to ensure the security and the welfare of the people. And that was a major campaign issue for President Tinubu, as it was for other candidates in the 2023 general election. What will gladden the hearts of the people of Nigeria is for them to be able to sleep at night with their two eyes closed. But at the human uh, level, you know, we commend uh, Mrs. Tinubu and uh, the other first ladies who traveled with her to commiserate. She was very good empathy. And, uh, okay, 500 million, that would be 1 million to 500, uh, uh, 500 uh, families, right? Yes, family. So 500 million naira. Well, the Renewed Hope uh, Initiative, I'm sure, is well resourced enough uh, to be able to do this. But on a general note, I would like to commend uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Remy Tinubu that so far, you know, her comportment has been uh, very good. And I hope that, uh, you know, she will continue in that fashion. You know, the elegance and the comportment that she has brought uh, to that uh, office. Uh, since she assumed her uh, position as First Lady, uh, you know, of Nigeria, she has not spoken out of turn. Her statements have been measured. Her programs have been carefully chosen. The press statements from our office have not been uh, out of turn or out of tune. And uh, I would just like uh, to say that she should be encouraged to continue in that fashion. Uh, with all the problems we have, you know, we cannot afford to have any belligerence from anybody's wife. So the supportive role uh, that she's, uh, you know, giving her husband and to other communities, I think is, uh, you know, uh, very good. I, and I guess this comes from experience. After all, when she was in Lagos, she introduced spelling B, uh, uh, you know, one governor a day thing, which was very successful and was sustained even after she was no longer first lady in Lagos State. But on, on the whole, there are many issues, and we hope that uh, before President Inumbu jets off to the United Nations uh, General Assembly, because he has another trip ahead of him, where he's also going to the uh, NASDAQ to go and ring the bell. Okay, all these ceremonies, photo opportunities, they are fine, but there are concrete issues to address. Only yesterday, we were discussing uh, FTC Russell, the subsidiary of uh, the London uh, Stock Exchange, you know, declassifying, you know, reclassifying uh, uh, Nigeria. And the, the front page story in uh, this day today shows the effect that this has had. And the effect that this has had is that, look, if, 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 if there's a problem in the Nigerian boss to the extent that, uh, you know, uh, there's been loss in terms of uh, stocks and, and all of that. And it could get worse when that downgrade takes effect from uh, uh, September 18. And the major reason that has been given is that this idea of floating the Naira is not working because there's no liquidity. And the investors uh, face serious problems. They can't repatriate their funds uh, uh, from, from Nigeria, even if they come here to invest. So you have a major plank of the economic direction of the government not working. Uh, manage float, uh, floating in uh, Nigeria. Today, the CBN is running to African Bank to collect uh, $3 billion. Tomorrow is uh, uh, collaborating with Flutter Wave. You know, just experimenting, as I think I pointed out either yesterday or two days ago. So these are serious issues because there's high cost of living, there's tension in the land. So even as the government goes about traveling up and down and uh, shaking hands and diplomacy, there are issues in terms of domestic policy that must be tackled because it's when we look good at home that we can look better outside. Absolutely. Um, well, welcome back to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. And um, as um, Dr. Bati had observed in that video, you'd see that it was quite a modest um, welcome entourage there. Just his, some primary ministers, a few people, it was at night. I mean, I don't think the fact that it was at night uh, would have stopped people who wanted to give him a triumphant entry, as I'd mentioned, um, you know, yesterday. But it's quite um, good to see that hopefully things are changing. And may I say, long may this reign, whereby it would just be business and we don't have too many people who sometimes are under uh, the guise of wanting to support, but truly are sycophants in many areas um, coming to um, welcome the president, nothing wrong, there, there's nothing illegal about it, but it just, the optics don't often look very good.
So kudos um, on that level. And also beyond that, also um, kudos with regards to what he was able to achieve on his trip. Many have termed this trip quite successful, especially in the area of um, positioning investment opportunities for Nigeria, um, the big news from the UAE, even though that hasn't yet been concluded in terms of the details. Yesterday's meeting with the um, officials from Nigeria and Emirates, we hope to bring you reports on that one with regards to how they've ironed out the issues and um, how it would play out in terms of implementation. So whilst we're rejoicing, let's rejoice cautiously until we find out what the details of that agreement will be. Now, with regards to him returning, a lot of issues on the table for him. Recall that during the negotiation with the NLC and organized labor, the Minister for Labor and Employment, um, Mr. Simon Along, had said that they should exercise patience until the president returns from his trip from the G20 summit, and then he'll address or be able to address the concerns of organized labor. That's still waiting on his table and would be priority because they've said the, the two-day strike that happened last week was a warning strike, and they were going to go on a full-blown strike, shutting down the um, economy if their concerns weren't addressed. So concerns around wage review, concerns around around palliatives. And I think another, um, you know, um, main, very important uh, memo would be concerns for Nigerians. Don't forget that post 100 days after his uh, announcement of the removal of fuel, fuel subsidy, we haven't yet realized concrete, um, you know, cushioning of the effects for many vulnerable Nigerians. So that's something else to look into. Aside from that, the minister's retreat is still pending, uh, you know, alongside other key decisions. And then very importantly, as has been highlighted, is consolidating on the wins on his trip. So now get to work with regards to follow up and ensuring that those pledges materialize to actuals when it comes to investments here in Nigeria. So more conversations being had, um, fine-tuning the details must be done, and we should get reports as Nigerians on that. With regards to the First Lady, again, as her, has already been established, great optics. It was actually quite great to see that she went there herself. In the past, this has been criticized with regards to leaders being far removed from challenges that happen, especially in areas that are not as, you know, in states that are not as big as perhaps the popular states of, you know, River State, we have in Lagos State. But to see her attend, you know, go there with other first ladies under her Renewed Hope Initiative, I think that's important to mention. And I end by saying that the reason I mentioned that it was her foundation is that some people have questioned, oh, where is this 500 million naira coming from? When it's a foundation, usually foundations are funded either from the personal um, purse of the individual or usually from donations from friends and supporters who believe in that organ in that um, foundation. And so that's possibly where the money has come from, not from um, you know, Nigeria's budget. But in terms of um, the governor also assuring that they will, they will make sure the money is judiciously spent and there's due process and it goes to the intended, that's very key as well. We'll move on to our next story this morning. And we go to Libya, where rescue teams are struggling to retrieve the bodies of victims that have been swept out to sea in tsunami-like flood. At least 2,300 have been killed, according to the Ambulance Authority in Derna, the worst affected city with about 10,000 people reported missing. Aid has started to arrive, including from Egypt, but rescue efforts have been hampered by the political situation in Libya, where the country is split between two rival governments. Two dams and four bridges collapsed in Derna, submerging much of the city when Storm Daniel hit on Sunday. The Red Crescent says the death toll from the floods is expected to rise even further. The initial numbers we are getting from the Libyan Red Crescent uh, about the uh, missed people all over the five cities, it reaches up to uh, or very close to 10,000 persons reported missing. Um, so it's very likely uh, that the number uh, uh, declared from Derna authorities could be close to the correct number. Uh, this is uh, to be confirmed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, upon the uh, uh, finalization of the assessment process. Uh, however, the number would I, I would expect uh, that the number would be very close to the correct one. Our teams on the ground uh, are uh, still doing their assessment, but uh, from what we see and from the news coming to us, the death toll is huge. Uh, it, uh, it might reach 2000s, really, uh, but we don't have a definite number right now. Uh, maybe later today or, or uh, 
maximum by uh, early morning tomorrow, we do, will do have definite numbers that will be ready to share. Right, updates on the Libya floods, um, we're fine. Mm. I mean, quite a very sad season. And um, as we all know, it gets to that time of the year when it's, uh, it's on the calendar, you know, for storms and hurricanes to happen and, and all of that. And we've had many of them. In fact, there's a, there's a whole naming system that is a very interesting algorithm at which they name the storms. I mean, we can go back to days of Hurricane Katrina and the likes and all of that. But, but Storm Daniel is said to be a Medicaid. And what it means is it's that big storm blowing across the Mediterranean. So uh, a hurricane in the Mediterranean is called a Medicaid. And uh, it's blown across uh, parts of the Mediterranean, uh, deepening into Libya. Some parts of Israel felt the heat, about 70 to 80 kilometers per hour, gusting winds and all of that. And this inundated uh, uh, parts of Libya, causing severe flooding and thousands and thousands of areas flooded away. Uh, the Egyptian authorities are trying to bring in some, you know, palliative sort of like help the people of Libya. And uh, it just shows that, yes, conversations about global warming is a big deal. Conversations about climate change is a big deal. And the far-reaching impact on our society are really, really debilitating. My heart goes out, out there to the authorities in Libya. And it's a very hard case in Libya because there's, there's sort of like a gulf in leadership. Even since the time of um, Gaddafi, there's always been a split across board. There's always been another big repression hub in Benghazi and there's also been another, you know, leadership hub in Tripoli. And that's what has become the case, even after the fight that led to uh, Gaddafi's killing and ouster, you know, Khalifa Haftar on one side and uh, the other people on the other side. So you've got, you know, uh, two different governments here and there. And it makes, you know, bringing in aid very, very hard to parts of Libya because there are two simultaneous government running at, at, at the same time out of Libya. But we just hope that these people, you know, can do their best and, you know, can uh, align their forces, align efforts and ensure that people get the much needed aid they need to be able to get through all of this pain and this f horror they're going through as a result of this storm. But hey, it's also a big indication that global warming is real. It's a big storm season out there. Storm Daniel is really, really impacting parts of the Mediterranean. We pray for also, you know, the people that have been affected, thousands that have been killed. We pray for the reports of their So just as we also take a time to also say, you know, very charitable words and good prayer words to the people also in Morocco reeling from the earthquake, that's still on. It's pretty much past the 72 hours threshold. And, you know, excavation and digging is still on, but the terrain is quite very hard. And it's so hard to get people out of there at times like this. Well, aid organizations have described what has happened in Libya as disaster beyond comprehension. Disaster beyond comprehension. Over 10,000 persons are missing. Over 1,000 people, 1,500, at the last count to be specific, have been reported dead. Buildings have collapsed, telecommunications have uh, ceased, you know, there's debris all over the place. And on top of all of this, in eastern, you know, uh, Libya, where this happened, the whole area is uh, more or less uh, a trouble zone and has been so since 2011 because of rival factions, renegades fighting within that area. So even intervention is made, you know, more difficult by the political and social situation in that area. So the world faces a major humanitarian crisis, dimensions of which are social, economic, and political. But in, in spite of this, you know, some countries have tried to move in. Red Cross has also tried to move in uh, to provide aid. But at a wider level, this is a reminder of the big conflict that man faces as global temperatures continue to rise, as there is, uh, you know, global warming. Um, in Greece, we had wildfires, right? In Hawaii, we had a similar problem with uh, nature. In Brazil, the Brazilian Meteorological Agency has had to issue uh, statements. In Bulgaria, there have also been issues. And now, it is Libya. And the issue is about Storm Daniel, yes. Winds traveling at uh, rapid, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
kilometers per hour and leaving destruction in its wake. And Libya may not be the, the last that we hear of this story, which is why it is unfortunate that, look, recently they had the G20 summit in New Delhi, where COP28 is around the uh, corner. At all of these, uh, at all of these uh, summits, world leaders just pay lip service to commitment to climate change. They pay lip service to reduction of fossil fuels and all of that. So the, the, there is that solidarity that is expressed when this tragedy comes one after the other. But in the real sense of it, you know, what, there isn't that high level of commitment which could move the needle in terms of uh, the uh, disaster that faces humanity. Uh, and we hope that it doesn't get to the level of a global catastrophe. But it is just as bad that from one place to the other, we begin to see patterns, you know, of the effect of this global warming that uh, the international body of experts uh, continue to warn about. Now, as for Nigeria, this should also be some kind of wake-up call for us. And I draw attention to one particular thing. In uh, Dutsma, the village that is most uh, affected in, in Libya, we were told that two dams collapsed in the process. And that added more to the uh, 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 flooding. Now, in Nigeria here, we, we don't take this issue about dams seriously. And I want to link it with this uh, Lagdo Dam matter. Look at the devastating effect of floods in, uh, in Libya now that the whole world is talking about. Here in Nigeria, there have been the uh, uh, meteorological uh, body of Nigeria has always been warning every rainy season about flood. There's also the perennial problem of Lagdo Dam. On August 23, the Cameroonians Cameroon said they were going to release water from a Lagdo Dam, right? As they warn us uh, regularly. Since 1982, when we si signed an agreement with uh, uh, Cameroon, we've been working on uh, uh, Dassenhausa uh, Dam in the Fufore local government area of Adamawa State. Nothing was done on that bridge since uh, maybe 2015 or 2014. I think we visited the place in 2014. And hence, you've been having flooding one after the other, either from, uh, directly from nature, added to it by the Lagdo Dam. What we have seen is the effect of flood. Beyond Storm Daniel, okay, what of the uh, dams that collapse? I hope a day will not come when a dam will collapse in Nigeria or something will happen, uh, you know, go wrong with Lagdo Dam and we will face flooding on a massive scale. So all of this should also provide lessons for other parts of the world beyond the international concern about what the world together should do, about global warming, about climate change, and the responsibility of the leadership to think ahead and to provide early warning signs. The United Nations, through Anthony Guterres, has been talking about disaster and risk reduction early warning signs that the international community should commit to at a more serious level. So these are some of the dimensions, but it's very unfortunate, I mean, to lose uh, 10,000 people, you know, just overnight like that uh, is really tragic indeed. I will commiserate with the people of Libya, a country that has been in a state of loss since 2011 when Muammar Gaddafi was deposed. Absolutely. Now, I'm talking about the dams. So the two dams were actually built to prevent soil erosion and flooding, and ironically, because um, the city, Dena, where this has occurred, has historically been plagued by floods. Um, unfortunately, in this instance, the two dams collapsed, hence exacerbating the effect of the floods following torrential rains in the city. And I think that's quite instructive because as I speak right now, I can hear rainfall, you know, massive rainfall here. And it has continued, you know, in terms of the last few days, we have experienced that. And so when we look at issues in places like Derna in Libya, we must also remember other areas so that we don't react. We prevent occurrences like that happening. This is massive devastation. Beyond the loss of life, loss of property, the pictures coming out of 
Libya is frightening. It's, it's, horrif it's horrific. It's, it's terrible. And in fact, the question is, can Libya survive this? Don't forget that this is also a test on Libya's infrastructure and development. Already mentioned that in the last 10 years, they've been plagued with bad leadership. They've not been able to decide whether it's the, um, you know, um, who, who's the faction that would lead. And so there hasn't been cohesive government in the last 10 years. Therefore, the response to this particular disaster hasn't been you know, very effective, especially from a Libyan perspective. However, kudos again to the international world. As already been mentioned, the international world cannot even afford to look away because already there are impacts in surrounding countries like Turkey, um, Bulgaria, and, and Greece, where about 27 people have been reported to have been killed, you know, direct impact them, and the other, you know, effect on other countries. Also, if Libya collapses or in, in the city collapses and we have people, you know, um, human beings who are displaced, they're going to look for ways to escape and then it becomes a human, we have a humanitarian crisis on our hands. That is, that is if we already do not. And so despite the fact that there will have been conversations around support for Libya not being as it ought to be. Now countries are now coming in and giving donations. Kudos to organizations like Red Crescent who have always, you know, Red Cross in some parts as it's called, Red Crescent in, in, the, in, in, in Islamic nations. They have come on board again. They donated $1 million to Morocco in, in, in the initial stage and now to Libya. So, so many things on our hands. And that is why you would understand where we have summits like G20, COP, dominating those conversations are issues around climate change, are issues around zero emission, issues that we as a continent in terms of Africa can no longer ignore. It's not just a conversation that happens in the West. It must be a conversation that dominates our conversations, you know, that dominates, that's hot on the table when we speak because it is easier and cheaper to prevent than it is to respond to natural disasters or to disasters of this nature. And so I'm hoping that in countries, not just in Nigeria, but across the African continent, areas around plastic waste, and um, waste, ending single-use plastic, um, drainages around our seashores, those conversations, how we dams being built to handle or to tackle flooding, taken seriously, and these monies not siphoned. So that when we have conversations like that, we're not waiting for humanitarian or uh, you know, um, global response when a disaster like this happens. And so really, really sad um, loss, of thousands of lives being lost in Libya. We just, we're not even finished speaking about Morocco, and now we're talking about Libya floods. And it looks like the numbers will only increase as we are, there are you know, more numbers missing than there are that have been reported to have died. Very sad, and um, again, like I mentioned, hopefully, Libya would survive this, Derna would survive this, as they say that 25% of the city has already gone to the floods. It, it, it's, it's been submerged by the floods in, in Derna. So it might take years to recover from this devastation, and hopefully we can prevent such from happening in other countries across Africa. We're having to deal with coups, man-made problems, and then we're having, having to deal with natural disasters such as floods and earthquakes. May God help us in this nation, and very importantly, may we have good leadership such that we are able to think ahead and not just respond to um, issues like this that in many cases are unforeseen but do happen and certain measures can reduce the impact of these devastations. <laughs>